welcome to the second installment of our series on setting up of a process manufacturing company uh, as in our last session uh, where we gone over setting up our items uh, we will again be using foodco a food company as our test company and in today's session we will be focusing on bill of materials about the bill of materials a few things to note is first of all bill of materials are required only for finished goods and intermediaries intermediaries are sometimes called sub-assemblies in discrete manufacturing environments uh, they're used for finished goods or intermediaries if and only if they are produced in-house versus being purchased only also if we have decided to use serial and lot tracking for our items then the auto build function that is available in MISIS will not be functional if SLT is turned on. Other options to consider are shop floor control, whether we're going to be using shop floor control or not, and our accounting methods that we use, whether we are using standard costing, average costing, FIFO, LIFO, and uh, these are important considerations to make decisions on before getting on with setting up our bills of material. Now, bill of material, as you can see in these bomb trees, uh, has a different look depending on whether we're using shop floor control or not. Obviously, without the shop floor control, it becomes a bit easier because it is the finished good and intermediary or intermediaries, depending on how many uh, sub-assemblies or intermediaries are feeding into finished goods, is a single layer. And all, of course, those intermediaries might have their own sub-assemblies but there is nothing in between whereas in a palm tree with a shop floor control we might uh, require a conversion bomb a ghost bomb as uh, we call it so it's simpler without the shop floor control but also we lose some detail when we don't use the shop floor control so that is one of the decisions as we have discussed in a previous slide that we need to make before we get going with our setup now in our first tab the header tab on a bill of material the fields that we need to look at are auto build as we also mentioned if you are using uh, uh, serial lot tracking as you can see here in this pop-up window there is the item setup window and serial lot tracking was decided on this box in the bottom in this case the item is lot tracked so auto build even if we change it from never to one of the other options it'll not work so we leave it as never uh, build quantity is what we are setting the bill of material for in this case it is one and this one has a unit of measure again identified in our item setup in this case in a pop-up window we see that the stock unit was defined as a box so when we set our build quantity to a specific uh, quantity like in this case one box we are saying we are going to list the items the materials required for us to be able to build one box of this finished good or, or whatever that item is in this case it is a finished good fg 1001 a protein bar box of it and then the accounting method that we use will determine whether we're going to use cost roll up or not it comes uh, the tick box there comes as checked as a default and if you're using standard costing it is usually advisable to uncheck that box because what it does is anytime you make changes to your bill of material if that box is checked it is going to update and revise your standard cost for the item whereas the principle of standard costing is that you set that cost once or maybe if you're revising it twice during the year once and then anything that happens after that during your manufacturing uh, the differences between your standard cost and your actual costs are recorded as variance so you don't want your cost roll up enabled to be checked if you're using standard costing in other accounting methods such as average or LIFO or FIFO you can leave that box checked and your 
costs will automatically update based on the changes you make on your farms. Now, moving on with an example that is a setup of a bomb without the shelf floor control, as that's the easier setup. We'll start with the easier one and we'll go from top down, meaning we'll create the bomb first for the finished good and then for the intermediary. We move on to the material tab and as you can see on the screen we have three screenshots. First the material tab and then the routing tab and then the bill of manufacturing which is the combination of the previous two tabs the material tab and the routing tab. On the material tab we are listing all the items that are required to make this one box of protein bar. In this case it seems we need our mixture that is the actual material uh, that makes up the protein bar and then we have paper package box and as a last line labor now you can see there is a detail type column here where we determine what detail type this item is and we'll talk more about this in our next slide when we're talking about the ingredients to make the mixture itself but it is safe to say whenever you put something as a consumed type what you're saying is that the input of this item is independent of the output doesn't matter what you get at the end as an output all of this item is going to be consumed in the process and we have our labor here as a line item because we're not using shop floor control if and as we will see in uh, upcoming slides, when we're using shelf floor control, the labor is associated directly with the operations that are specified in the routing tab. In this case, because there is no shelf floor control, we don't get to specify our operations and we still want to include our labor cost as part of our bill of material. So we calculate how much it takes uh, for us to build this one item and it doesn't have to be a single labor line if there are different types of labor that are used in the manufacturing process of this item we can list them and you can code them in your master files for uh, labor for items and you can have labor picking labor packing and you can list them there as well with their cumulative times and based on the unit cost that you have identified in your master file for that labor it will take the required quantity and multiply it with that and come with an extended cost. Now, as we said, because there is no shelf flow control, the routing tab is blank. There are no operations listed here, which would have been cross-referenced in the material tab's last column operation number. And because there are no routing steps, the bill of manufacturing is simply a listing of the materials from the material tab. So this is obviously a much easier setup and as we move on to the setup for the bill of material for the intermediary the mixture one so that was the first item on our line for the finished good we have the mixture and the actual product that is used in the making of the finished good we see how this is being built what is needed to make this item so in this case our again auto build is never and our cost roll up is not enabled because in this model we're using standard costing but our build quantity is not one anymore we're not making one box of something in this case we're actually making a whole batch of something in the case of the mixture 01 the unit of measure happens to be pounds so the batch size uh, this company decided was 240 pounds was the batch size it's a smaller batch uh, relatively and now when they list their materials in the material tab they're going to list each item with a required quantity to be able to make 240 pounds of this mixture so moving on to the material tab you'll see that all items except the last item which is labor is marked as consumed now we put all these items 50 liters of water you know 20 pounds of protein powder whatever these items are into the mixture and at the end we expect to get 240 pounds there is always some level of variation there you can maybe get 241 pounds and you might be measuring this or not even measuring that and you might be assuming that you're getting 240 pounds but no matter what 
these items that are put in there as marked as consumed, that means they are just depleted all the way, regardless of whether you get 240 or 245, you're using up all of this. And again, because the routing tab is blank, there will be nothing on the bill of manufacturing in addition to the materials themselves. So this is a very simple setup. It's just one, two step. I mean, if there were any assembled items here, like sub-assemblies, as we would call in discrete manufacturing, then you would have uh, additional bombs for that feeding into this bomb. So there might be many layers, but uh, this is the simpler uh, setup that we are showing as an example today. Now, going on to setting up a bomb with uh, shop floor control, it'll look a little bit different. Uh, so we're taking again the same finished good, the protein bar, and it looks like it is a very similar setup. It has the mixture, the paper package, and the box. You notice that the labor line is missing. That's because when we go to a routing tab, now we are identifying operations. And these operations will have specific times associated with them here. Uh, the available options for you to set up are run time, batch setup time, queue time, and wait time. It is important to know that the batch setup time is dependent on the batch size here. So if you leave the batch size as zero and enter a batch setup time here, that will be considered as a one-time setup. But if you have to change, say, your tooling every 100 pounds, um, then you would put batch size 100 here. This is not dependent on your build quantity or anything else. This is how often you need to repeat a specific setup process. And if you put 100 pounds here and put five minutes here, depending on what your build quantity here is or your order quantity, it is going to repeat that five minutes every 100 pounds. And runtime is per unit. That means if the unit of measure for this is box. For every box, picking takes five minutes on average. And on the bill of manufacturing tab, you see that the routing and the material tabs are combined because these routing steps, picking, molding, cooking, and packing, has been cross-referenced here to the items. Obviously, you don't see all of them because picking is when the mixture is consumed and packing is when the paper package and the boxes are consumed. There is no material consumption during molding and cooking because the mixture has already been uh, consumed in picking operation. And this combination screen shows us picking has the picker with a labor A and the intermediary, the mixture. Molding has only the molding operation no material cooking has a labor and no material and then packing has those two packaging materials so here we're able to obtain more information in more detailed way uh, regarding our labor and the consumption of the materials rather than consuming all of them in one go we are able to say okay this item is consumed at this step the next item is consumed in the other step moving on to setting up our intermediary in this case if you notice it's very different than the bomb without the shop floor control the build quantity is still 240 because we're trying to get 240 pounds of this uh, mixture but in the shop floor control turned off option of the bill of material in the material tab we had all the items listed here we see an item that's called intermediary 1001-b and there is one batch of it, and that's it, and there are no routing steps, even though this is a shop floor control bomb. That's because this is what we call the conversion bomb. Uh, it is a ghost bomb. It's really, all it's doing is that it's taking an item and changing its unit of measure. It's not doing anything else. Why is this needed? Let's talk about that. Well, as we discussed, uh, we need to enter certain times for each of the operations however as your batch sizes grow and if your times for each of your labor components is not a very uh, big amount of time 
the unit of measure in minutes makes it very difficult to enter meaningful uh, minutes here. So let's look at an example. If the batch size was 6,000 liters, which in our case is 240 pounds, but I'm showing a different example of 6,000 liter batch size. If we had a picking of 30 minutes, staging of 10 minutes and mixing of 60 minutes, these mean that to make the 6,000 liters, it took me 30 minutes to pick the items necessary, 10 minutes to stage all of it, and mixing them all was an hour. But what is being asked for me here is for each operation runtime per unit, meaning per liter. So I need to take this 30 minutes and divide it by 6,000. And this gives me quite a small number, 0 0.005, and even less in the case of staging, 0 0.0017. Now, companies might use uh, in their formatting two decimal places. So when you enter this, this would be zero minutes. So it would ignore the staging labor. Because these numbers become too small sometimes to enter or to be considered, what we tend to do is use a conversion bomb. And what do we mean by that? Well, we create first a batch with a build quantity of one, and the unit of measure is one. And we enter all our items in that without any labor. To make this one batch, we need the 50 liters of water, 70 pounds of flour, um, everything as such. And picking and mixing are entered with run times per unit. In this case, per unit is one batch. So you're able to enter the full time it took you to make that batch. In our previous example of 6,000 uh, liters, you would enter picking 30 minutes instead of entering 0 0.005. You would enter here 30 minutes, 10 minutes, and 60 minutes, which make more sense and is easier to calculate the actual labor cost. So when this bomb is completed, there is a total cost for it to make this one batch. And then because we need to have this not in batch, but in pounds or liters, then we use the conversion bomb to turn it into pounds or liters just by taking one batch of this and saying what comes out of this is 240 pounds of the same material. And you will notice that whether you use shuffler control or not, the cost breakdown will end up being the same. Because you're including your labor costs as a material line item, it will not show as a labor cost. The one on the left hand side here is the header tab for uh, finish good with the shelf floor control on. And the way to tell that is there is labor cost, overhead cost, and a burden rate mentioned. On the right hand side, we have the header uh, tab shown with the shelf floor control off. So everything shown is, is a material cost. Even our labor was entered in the material tab, so it's seen as a material cost. But because in the item master, the labor has been checked off as labor, system still knows that it is a labor cost and backs it off from the salary or wage expense. And in a sense, in the accounting method, it works the same way. And what you would do, whether you're using shelf floor control or not, depending on which method you choose, you would set your standard cost based on your unit costs, assemble costs here. So in here, the closest we came was 1138 and in here 1140. Not to have this 0 0.02 dollar variance, you wouldn't set your cost to 1140 as we have currently in the system uh, is set up based on uh, shelf floor control on. We would have it set as 1138 and that would record no variance. The point being, doesn't matter which method you use, shop floor control on or off, you will have the same cost and you will be able to have zero variance as long as you produce uh, to that cost. Now, this is how we set up our bill of materials. And in our next video, we are going to get into manufacturing orders, how to create them, um, if we're using shelf floor control, how to start them and how to complete them. And that's, of course, with or without the uh, shelf floor control. Uh, we hope that you're finding this video series uh, beneficial to you on setting up your process manufacturing operations. See you next time.